So now that we've talked about the pros and cons of synchrony, let's change gears a little bit and talk about the pros and cons of asynchrony. So first of all, what is asynchrony? I, pr I probably should have defined this in more detail earlier, but in a nutshell, asynchrony is a means of concurrent programming where the caller does not block waiting for the callee to complete. And a, a classic example here is sending a letter or a package through surface mail or sending an email where you, you send it and then you go off and do other things. And then at some point a response shows up again. That's an example of asynchrony. What happens with asynchronous programming is you make an asynchronous call and that call will return almost immediately with something called a future. And then the computation will actually run in the background concurrently. And once the, once the background computation is done, that future can be used to obtain the results that came back. So another way of looking at this is that the processing that takes place here that runs in the background is independent of the calling threads flow of control. So as you can see here, it's kind of like uh, placing an order at a restaurant. We're, we're doing this all the time now, right? You, you place your order for pickup, you then do your thing, and at some point you show up and pick up your pick up your order. You don't have to sit there at the restaurant with your mask on <laughs> waiting to be served. It's, it's done in an asynchronous way, which obviously is a lot more popular nowadays than maybe it was uh, a year or so ago. When the asynchronous computation completes, then the future is so-called triggered. And what that means is that the caller, the, the one that's trying to get the result, can then go ahead and redeem the future to get the final computation's result. So if you look at this sort of from a, a state diagram, you can see that we start something running asynchronously in the background, the client starts things off, doesn't have to block, and then at some point when things are done, it goes ahead and obtains the results. And we'll talk about how it can obtain the results later. Now, the nice thing about this model is that the caller, the client in this case, may or may not block waiting for the results, depending on various factors. Does it really need the results to keep going? Can it do some other things while the computation is running in the background? And we'll talk about some of the pros and cons of different ways of reclaiming the results from the future at the appropriate time using different asynchronous programming models that Java supports. One example of asynchronous programming that is interesting, although it's been uh, deprecated a bit more recently, is Android's async task framework. And it's a really cool framework that performs background operation processing where you can publish, you can have the background tasks, publish results on the user interface thread without having to manipulate threads or handlers directly. So what you do, you as a programmer, you say, here's my async task, execute this async task, it goes off and does some processing. And so it'll run these long duration operations asynchronously in one or more background threads and these background threads, if they happen to block on I.O., for example, or on a synchronizer, for example, or waiting to access a database where it's a complicated query, for example, the user interface thread is not going to be blocked while these computations in the, run, in the background run and finish up their, their job. The user interface thread, the calling thread or the caller thread, can be notified when things are finished, either successfully or unsuccessfully. Uh, and it can also be notified if something fails, and they can also be notified incrementally during the processing of the long running computation. And so in, in an essence, the asynchronous task framework shields client code from the details of programming this asynchronous computation and having to access the futures and so on. So that's a quick overview of asynchronous programming. Let's talk about the pros and cons of this model. So one of the key aspects of this model that's really nice is it tends to be a lot more responsive because the calling thread, the caller, doesn't need to block waiting for the asynchronous request to complete. So you're basically doing asynchronous method invocation. And the nice part about that is it allows the user interface to be responsive. So you don't get the, the dreaded hourglass or the dreaded color wheel that you get with with Mac OS or Windows respectively, or, or used to get with Mac OS or Windows respectively when something blocked the user interface thread. Another nice benefit of this model is 
elasticity. Because now that we're decoupling the invocation of something from its computation, we can have the computations running in a pool of threads that can be mapped scalably and concurrently onto multiple processing cores using things like the common fork join pool or the cache thread pool or other kinds of thread pools that you might have with, with Java or other programs. So it's making a system that's more elastic. That in turn allows better use of parallelism that's available in multi-core systems. And this is particularly useful in cloud computing environments. Although, as I mentioned before, that's not necessarily what we're doing with with Java completable futures, but it is something that is doable if you use Java with other frameworks like Hadoop or Sparks. But of course, you don't always get everything for free. There are some downsides with asynchrony. One of the downsides is the computations become less predictable. And that's because asynchronous operations inherently are designed to run in the background. And so you don't have this kind of request response like manner where you invoke a call, you wait, you get a result. You invoke another call, you wait, you get a result. So you start running these calls in the background and they take however long they take to run. And so things may end up taking different amounts of time and they may also occur in different orders as we'll see in a second. Notice that this non-determinism is a general problem with concurrency and not just asynchrony. The minute you start doing things concurrently, then um, it's kind of all bets are off as to how long things will take to run because it's up to the underlying operating system and virtual machine and hardware to figure out when things get scheduled and when things get executed. And then the other dimension, which I, I alluded to just a moment ago, is that the results can come back in a different order than the original calls were made. So you can get out of order results. Now, sometimes you don't care. It's kind of like the Java parallel streams where you say, you know, order doesn't really matter. I don't care about encounter order. I'm just going to go ahead and run this stuff and whatever order it comes back in, I'll be perfectly happy with that. But other times you do actually care about the order. So if you care about ordering, then additional time and additional effort may be required if you have to order the results somehow. Another issue of asynchrony that makes things more complicated is the fact that programming and debugging may also be harder to do. Why is that? Well, probably the most obvious reason is that most developers have not uh, gotten a nice warm fuzzy feeling, a nice intuitive feeling for the patterns and best practices of asynchronous programming. So it takes a while to get your head around this particular way of doing things because stuff isn't occurring in the same order and it's taking different amounts of time to run. And when you debug your program, you will find that when you debug it, it'll perform differently than if you don't debug it because you're changing the order in which things are running. Another key element, which is really one reason why completable futures are so cool, is that asynchronous programming without the proper support from the language and or the runtime platform and or the class libraries that provide that runtime platform can be very tricky. And in fact, if you have ever programmed in JavaScript, then you may be familiar with something called callback hell. And callback hell is a particular problem, a twisted maze of spaghetti code structure you get with asynchronous processing in JavaScript, and that's because it, it lacks some of the cool features we're going to talk about here with completable futures. Another problem, of course, is that it can be hard to track down errors due to the unpredictable nature and the out-of-order nature of the processing. Again, these problems are really a general issue with concurrent and parallel programming. They just happen to manifest themselves when you start doing a lot of asynchronous style processing. So let's weigh the pros and cons of asynchrony and see if we can come up with any general consensus or any guidance at this stage before we get into too many details. So there are really two things that are needed in order for the pros of asynchrony to outweigh the cons of asynchrony relative to doing synchronous programming. Synchronous programming is kind of the, the comparison point. It's the baseline because that's what we all know how to do based on our other experience. So asynchrony had better give you something that's a bigger bang for your buck or it's just not worth the trouble. So one thing that should happen if you choose to do things asynchronously is you should get better performance. So wouldn't it be crazy if you spent all this extra time with more complicated programming and more complicated debugging and then your program ran slower? Like what would be the point of that? So we'll see later when we do apples to apples comparisons between implementations that use completable futures versus Java parallel streams that in fact, 
going with the asynchronous programming approach is often, is often a win and sometimes a big win relative to doing more synchronous programming, even if it's parallel synchronous programming. And if you take a look at the results on this slide, you can see that the completable futures implementations of this image stream gang example run faster, noticeably faster than even the parallel streams versions. The parallel streams version is easier to program, but it doesn't run as, as fast. And the other thing that we would like here is we'd like the asynchronous programming model to reflect more intuitively the key principles of the reactive programming paradigm that we talked about before. So we want things to be responsive, resilient, elastic, and of course, message driven. Well, the good news is that Java's completable future framework provides an asynchronous concurrent programming model that performs well and supports key elements of the reactive paradigm. And we will talk in a lot more detail about that as we go further along and explore other aspects and capabilities in Java and its completable futures framework.